your congenial, convivial, and amiable host. As always, great to have you in the conversation today. Looking forward to it very much. We are stacked and packed and locked and loaded. Democrats starting their convention today. I am literally awash in stories about the Democratic National Convention and some of the some of the problems that they're uh, dealing with. And we'll get into all of that as the program unfolds. Second hour, I'm going to be having presidential historian Doug Weed on the program. He was a senior political advisor to the Ron Paul campaign. And one of the breaking stories today is that there is a strong possibility that Ron Paul is going to run a third party candidacy. And one of the questions that we're going to be asking you when we get to the end of this first hour is, what do you think about a third party Ron Paul candidacy? What do you think about that? Uh, so he, he, 300 of his devoted followers had a conference call on Friday night to talk about this possibility. One of the men on that call said that as of Friday, Ron Paul is no longer a Republican. And apparently the path to him running as a third-party candidate would be as a libertarian candidate. Gary Johnson would have to bring him on as his vice presidential candidate, or they would switch and put Ron Paul at the top of the ticket, and the current VP for the Libertarian Party would have to step aside, and I have no idea whether he would be positioned or willing to consider something like that. But Ron Paul is going to make an appearance on Jay Leno tonight, and uh, according to the information, is going to make an announcement. Got some kind of announcement to make on Jay Leno tonight, so we'll be interested to see how all of that uh, develops. So all that and more to come as the program develops. We're going to spend a lot of time on the question that it's being asked, are you better off than you were four years ago? And we'll hear some of the Democrats fumble around trying to answer that question. Now, before we get into all that, I want to turn our attention to the Word of God. First uh, Kings chapter 13, you know, one of the responsibilities that the clergy has is to speak truth to power. That's a prophetic responsibility that members of the clergy have. The historians evaluated the kings based on one criteria criterion and one criterion only did this king do what was right in the sight of God or did he do what was evil in the sight of God that was the only measuring stick that they had they had the revealed will and revealed word of God here is what is right in the eyes of God then they would compare that to what the president what the kings our version is president what the kings did and if what the kings did lined up with what was in the revealed word of God then those who spoke truth to power the prophets the preachers they would commend them. They would praise them for doing so. If a king did something which was evil, according, they line up what the king did, line it up against the revealed word of God. And if it was at variance with the revealed word of God, then it was the responsibility of the prophet, responsibility of the proclaimer of truth, to speak truth to power and condemn that political leader for what he was doing. And that remains the responsibility that preachers and clergymen and prophets have today. I think that's one of the responsibilities that those that are in conservative talk radio, for instance, especially in conservative talk radio, is to speak truth to power, to evaluate what happens in public life according to one standard and one standard only. And that's all that guides us here at Focal Point. It's all that guides us here at the American Family Association at AFR Talk. Are our politicians doing what is evil in the sight of God or doing what is right in the sight of God? Now, a Striking story in 1 Kings 13, the kingdom had divided at this point. Jeroboam had led a rebellion against Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, because he was going to lay down even more taxes and more regulations than his father Solomon had. And the wise counsel was lighting up on these people. You've got to back off these regulations. You've got to back off the taxes. You've got to back off the burdensome intrusion of the central government into their lives. If you do, they'll follow you forever. And his young buck friend said, no, you've got to bring the hammer down. You got to let them know that, man, you think my father was tough. You ain't seen nothing yet. I am the man. I am the boss. You got to bring the hammer down. He listened to the young Turks that he was running with and brought the hammer down. You had civil war. You had anarchy. And the 10 northern tribes split. They said, we're out of here. We don't want to be subjected to this kind of tyranny any longer. And so Jeroboam goes north to start his own kingdom. And 1 Corinthians uh, Kings 13, 1 Kings 13 is about a man of God. We never find out his name. He's just referred to repeatedly over and over again as a man of God who brought the word of the Lord to Jeroboam. He went to Jeroboam and he spoke truth to power. And he said uh, to, uh, to Jeroboam 
as Jeroboam is standing there by this, this false altar, Behold, a son shall be born to the house of David, Josiah by name, and he shall sacrifice on you the priests of the high places who make offerings on you, and human bones shall be burned on you. And this was a prophecy that was fulfilled in the days of Josiah several hundred years later. And he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is the sign that the Lord has spoken. Behold, the altar shall be torn down, the ashes that are on it shall be poured out. Now this ticked off Jeroboam, and he reaches out his finger to tell his men to seize Jeroboam, or to seize the man of God, and his hand withers up, it freezes. He stretched out his hand against him, it dried up so he could not draw it back to himself. And so he pleads with the man of God to pray for him that his hand would be restored, and he does. Now, God had told the man of God, look, when you go to Jeroboam, I want you to go straight there, and I want you to come straight back. I don't want you to deviate. I don't want you to take a detour. You go straight there, and you come straight back. Now, on the way back, there was a prophet, an old prophet, who lived in Bethel. He heard that the man of God had come. He wanted to entertain the guy, and so he invited the guy to come to his house and said, look, God has told me that you're to go back by a different way. The Lord told me that, and the man of God consented to it. He allowed this old prophet to tell him something that was not true. God himself had said, go straight there, go straight back. Here this prophet says, hey, I've heard from God. He told me to tell you to take a detour. And the man of God did that. And on his way on this other route, he was jumped by a lion and uh, chewed to death. His donkey he was riding lives. And so the point clearly is, is the men of God who speak the truth not only must speak the truth of God to power, they must obey the word of God. Nobody gets a pass on that. The standard of obedience is there for everyone. Prophets, priests, and kings all must live and obey the abiding word of God. Well, let's go to prayer for ourselves and for our nation. Lord God, we are sobered as we read the story about this man of God. He was given a word from you for a king, and he was faithful to deliver that word, even at considerable risk to himself. Yet he himself made a choice to set aside the word that you had given to him and paid the ultimate penalty for his disobedience. I pray for myself and my family, the listening audience of Focal Point and AFR Talk, for President Obama, all of our elected officials, every man, woman, and child in the United States. And I pray that we will be men and women of God who can be trusted with the word of the Lord. I pray that we will declare your truth when others need to hear it, even when it is risky to do so. I ask you to defend us and protect us as you did this man of God when he spoke truth to power. But I also pray, Lord, that we will not make the mistake this man made. May we take your word seriously and not disobey your clear commands. I pray that we will be strong in your word, even if another man of God appeals to us to disobey your plain teaching. May we hold firmly in faith and in obedience to your word, no matter who tries to adjust it or change it. I pray that you will send men of God to those who hold political power in our community and nation. Use them to bring a corrective word from you where it is necessary. In Jesus' name, amen.